So, David. Okay, great. I'm hoping you all can see my screen. Is that true, Ricky? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. So uh, the motivation of the research that I'll be talking about today is really to demonstrate that dielectric spectroscopy can non-invasively detect subsurface ice, adsorb water, and possibly ilmenite and nanophase iron. Um, well, since this is a volatiles meeting, I'm not going to talk about the ilmenite and the nanophase iron right now. It's just concentrate on the, on the water. So this was actually originally suggested by Alvarez in a science paper in 1973 that you could use dielectric identification to actually map permafrost in the lunar regolith. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, what dielectric relaxations are and how we can use them as a signal, and then how we can measure this signal on the moon. Uh, so this is uh, our lab setup that we use. Um, this is a picture inside an ultra-low freezer uh, that we can also take down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. Uh, we have a sample holder here. It's a, it's a parallel plate sample holder. We put our ice samples, uh, uh, regolith, regolith analogs, mixed with ice in here. Uh, then we just uh, we inject current, and we, we measure the magnitude and phase of the resultant voltage. Then we change the frequency, do it again. We build up a frequency sweep. Then we change the temperature and do it all again. Uh, so this is an example of some data. This is from a, a sample from Lake Vostok. This is the accretion ice right above it. And uh, so you'll see four plots here, and I'll be showing these uh, a lot. And we've got permittivity on the left side, real and imaginary, top and bottom. And then we've got the conductivity in the phase. And then the colors indicate uh, the, the temperature in degrees C. Uh, the, the warmest will always be in red. And so what you see here is a, is a great frequency dependence in the dielectric properties. And this is the signal we're looking for to, to map this in the ground using geophysics. So at high frequency, uh, these protonic defects, which are the charges that move through the ice lattice that try to store the electric field, they can't keep up with very fast electric fields. So that's why the permittivity is so low at high frequency. Then at low frequency, they, they are able to separate fully, and they rest there, and they're able to store a, a, you know, a much larger uh, electric field in the sample. And then right where this relaxation is going, where, where we get maximum change here, that this is where the charges are, all, are constantly moving. And so uh, if we look at the imaginary permittivity, which is a function of the loss, uh, you can see it peaks there. And that peak is actually is, is called the relaxation frequency. So I'm going to plot that relaxation frequency in this next figure as a function of temperature, uh, just to, to show how, how temperature dependent these relaxations are. So this is this plot here. We've got 1,000 over T here on the bottom. Uh, I show temperature in K up here on the top. We've got relaxation frequency decreasing as we go up on this left scale left Y scale. So uh, for that, that Lake Vostok ice, uh, it will, be, it will uh, follow this black line, which is the intrinsic defect. So every ice, uh, ice crystal out there has intrinsic defects in it. And then it will start bending over and following this green curve. So this green curve is when we actually have extrinsic defects in there. So either chloride substituting in for the H2O in the crystal lattice, fluoride, ammonium, things like that. And so even in our triply deionized samples on Earth, we, we always get this bare minimum of extrinsic defects. And this Vostok sample also follows this. And then this is uh, measured all the way down in, down to these temperatures, showing where this ice relaxation is. Now, if we, we saturate this ice with uh, 200 micromolars of chloride actually in the ice lattice, then it follows this magenta or purple line here. And if we have anything in between saturation and, and this like, deionized ice, it will actually follow this intrinsic line and then bend over, kind of paralleling this green line, and then it will merge into this uh, magenta line. And then the only thing that can really get us above that magenta line is if we have ammonium. Um, that allows these charges to move even faster and, and actually for you to dump even more of these charges, uh, ha have a higher solubility. Uh, but we don't really expect ammonium on the, on the moon. Uh, so uh, anytime you have more extrinsic defects, you increase your relaxation frequency. The reason why this is important is because on the moon, uh, this is where you might expect to find uh, you know, subsurface ice on the moon, anywhere any, at temperatures below 145 K. So in this, in this blue shaded area is where we shall, should find our relaxation frequency of ice. Uh, now there's a few things that might push it over. If we get radiation defects and they act as extrinsic defects, we might actually get higher frequency relaxations. So this would be a good thing, because um, using dielectric spectroscopy, we can really only measure uh, this relaxation frequency to 10 to the minus 4 hertz. 
Uh, so this means we can only see, we can only detect a subsurface ice if we have a, an area where the ice is, uh, has a temperature of above 100 K. Uh, the radiation may actually uh, allow us to see, uh, see to colder areas, uh, but we still need to test that. Uh, so then, uh, moving away from ice and now going into adsorbed water, this is a fine sand with one monolayer. This, uh, this sand has a, a surface area, it's a monolayer of water, has a specific surface area of, of 0.1 uh, meters squared per gram, where lunar regolith would be uh, almost one. And so you can see, at this low frequency, we're getting this dielectric, uh, th this is a relaxation, but more specifically, it's called a dispersion. It's very broadband. It goes, uh, it extends from the millihertz all the way up to the gigahertz. Uh, it's very temperature dependent, as you see. And so this allows us actually to figure out that, uh, to show that we do have this, uh, that one monolayer on that sand. Um, and we, we call this uh, an anomalous low frequency dispersion, or the LFD for short. Uh, then if we add a little bit more water, uh, one volume percent on the sand, uh, you can see that, that things change drastically. So before we had a scale over here on the real primitivity of three, 3 to 3.6, and now we're going you know, even above 1,000 here. So adding just a little bit of water uh, with, with the adsorbed water uh, gives you these, these really giant uh, relaxations. And so what you'll see over here is uh, the, these temperatures are, are above freezing. Uh, so this, this relaxation isn't due to ice. This is actually due to adsorbed water. So in the LFD, in that, with just one monolayer, all the charges are moving parallel to the surface. Uh, once you add more than one monolayer, the charges can actually move perpendicular to the surface, up and down, and that gives you another relaxation phenomenon. So that, that's what's going on here, and it drops down and it moves out here, uh, labeled here with the adsorbed water. And the ice, you can see over here in this plot, and, and uh, I'll zoom in to show you here. Uh, so this is a very similar uh, relaxation mechanism to what we saw earlier uh, with the Lake Vostok accretion ice, uh, except for it's it's very small in magnitude because you only have one volume percent of ice in there. And so this shows us that we can actually detect ice in a, in a sample. So, so we can not only detect ice at one volume percent, but we can also look at adsorbed water. We can see if there's, there's, you know, if there's at least one monolayer, and then if there's more than one, one monolayer by these different polarization mechanisms. Uh, so here, here's an example of sand with a bunch of different uh, volume percents of ice in it. And so here we're going to talk about quantitative, quantitatively detecting ice in the subsurface. So we have different amounts here, and you can see that this low frequency dielectric constant here, permittivity, uh, increases drastically. Uh, what you'll also see is that this, the relaxation frequency, again, where the maximum is at the imaginary part, actually shifts to a higher frequency. So that, this is actually a good thing for us. It will, it will allow us to detect ice colder, and this seems to be a poor, poor wall effect. When the ice is very close to the pore walls, uh, somehow we, we get faster relaxations. So it's not exactly clear how that happens, but it, it always does. Uh, so we fit a dielectric mixing model to this, and you can see it fits actually pretty good. Uh, and, and this is actually theoretically predicted uh, about 10 years ago. And, uh, and the, the experiments show that it, it continues to work out. So we believe we can quantitatively uh, map uh, subsurface ice content. So how will we do this? Uh, this is how we do field measurements on Earth. So we have two electrodes, uh, these transmitting electrodes, this A and B, where we actually inject current into the ground. And so we inject this with a certain frequency, make the measurement, and then, and then sweep through a number of frequencies. Uh, we measure the, the, the voltage response uh, with these two potential electrodes, M and N here. And then between the amplitude response, the ratio of the amplitude response um, times the geometric factor, we can get resistivity. And then the time shift gives us our phase. And so that's how we make a very similar plots to, uh, to the lab measurements that I was showing. Uh, one of the big problems on the moon is that it's uh, very highly resistive, the regolith there, because it's so cold and there's no liquid water of any sort. So we actually have to, instead of pounding like a steel electrode into the ground like we do on Earth, we have to use capacitively coupled electrodes. So this is just an example of a capacitively coupled electrode that we have. Uh, this is just a copper mesh, and it's just sitting on grass and we're able to, to, to do these measurements with this. We're, we're developing uh, more advanced electrodes than this, uh, but this is where we're starting. Uh, so then, you know, how do we actually do this on the moon? Some ideas. Uh, so also our depth of penetration is about 30% of our maximum offset. 
So if A to B here was 10 meters, we'd be able to see 3 meters into the subsurface. And so what we could do is, if, if we just had a static lander, we could actually put uh, electrodes on its, uh, on its landing, uh, landing legs and actually just detect the, the subsurface directly beneath the lander. Or we could put these on, a rover, on rover wheels and profile as that rover drove along. Uh, what David, you have we'd really like seconds. to do is send out a, a, ballistic, uh, uh, a ballistic cable here and have a uh, number of uh, electrodes uh, get, get some more uh, diversity with our electrodes and really look at the heterogeneity that we might see in the subsurface. And in doing so, we can actually create a, a two-dimensional two uh, subsurface map of, of where the ice is in the subsurface. Uh, so dielectric spectroscopy instruments or, or similar ones ha have been flown previously. They've been flown on Titan. Uh, they, they were on these booms out here. They were capacitively coupled to the surface. Uh, and then they, uh, a similar instrument was flown on Mars Phoenix. This one uh, actually galvanically coupled, which meant the low frequency actually didn't work because it was too resistive. Uh, but they were able to detect azure water and liquid brine there. Uh, and then uh, Philae. Uh, which will be landing on a comet uh, in 2014. Uh, on, its, uh, on its lander legs, it has three electrodes. And then on its arm, it has another electrode. So it can, it can go around and, and produce your uh, different geometry so you can see the different depth. Uh, and then also to compare this to other uh, you know, prospecting instruments that, that might be taken. Uh, ground penetrating radar uh, will be, by far give you the greatest depth of penetration and the best resolution. The problem with this is you don't get any sensitivity to ice. So we found this in the, in the Martian case. Uh, we have Sherrod and Marsis. Uh, they, they've mapped the Medusa Fosse formation to a dielectric permittivity of 3.9, uh, very low loss. And this could either be ice-rich sediments, or it could be a completely dry volcanic tuff. There's no way to, to figure out the difference. Uh, it's it's non-unique. Uh, the neutron spectrometer is sensitive to hydrogen. But the problem is you don't know if it's solar wind implantation, adds or water, ice, exactly how it is. Uh, and it's limited to really the only top meter or so. Dielectric spectroscopy can give you subsurface identification based on unique dielectric signatures of ice and adsorbed water. So just kind of comparing this to, to the orbital data that we've seen with, with the LROC, the LRO camera, we're, we're getting very high resolution images of the surface. But we don't know what exactly they're, what these features relate to, what their mineralogy is. And so that, that would be similar to ground penetrating radar. We're going to get the structure very well. But to understand what's in that structure, we need a spectroscopy instrument, kind of like M cubed, uh, already worked on the moon. So here in conclusion, a dielectric spectroscopy allows us to detect subsurface ice in, in the warmer, permanently shattered regions, allows us to detect adsorbed water down to about 180K. After that, it goes out of our relaxation, our, our frequency range. And then dielectric spectroscopy can also discriminate between adsorbed water and ice and also determine the subsurface ice concentration for depths of up to 10 meters. And with that, I'd like to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. Appreciate that. Uh, I just want to get one of these to the moon as quickly as, uh, as possible. So uh, that sounds just great. So our first, uh, let's just take time for uh, maybe three questions here. Uh, first question from Durga Prasad, what do you expect the size and mass of such a sensor would be? Uh, well, that depends on how many electrodes you put on it. Um, we're, yeah, Bob Grimm is really the better one to ask on that. And uh, maybe he can comment on that. But it's a, it's a few kilograms. It, it, yeah, it really depends on if, if we're doing this ballistically deployed uh, string or not. Um, so if you just put it on the rover wheels, uh, it, it could probably be pretty light. A few a few uh, kilograms or so. OK, thanks. Next question from uh, Jerry Sanders. For your measurements to work, does the ice content need to be homogeneous? If you have a surface that <coughs> de-iced layer, what, what is that? Yeah. Will it prevent that desiccated layer? Will it prevent De Desiccated, no, I think it, that's it meant to say, yeah. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, th this is one of the, the benefits to it. So uh, we're really sensitive to the volume percent that's in there. It doesn't matter if it's all connected. Um, so if, if you were just doing DC connectivity, everything would have to be connected through. We don't care. It can be isolated in different pockets. Um, we could have a desiccated top layer. We could see right through that. So that's where having different geometries of electrodes will actually give us, a, allow us to make a better picture. If you just have 
you know, four electrodes on your land legs, you're just going to get a bulk average of, of what you can sense. Uh, but if you can do, you know, real small uh, geometries and then expand out to bigger ones, you could actually tell that there's a desiccated layer on top. And then as the, the, the bigger offsets will actually give you more ice, which the less desiccated below that, and, and so on. Okay, great, great. We'll just take the last two here um, from Brown. How, how, the, how does the porosity of mineralogy and grain size affect the signal? Yeah, so, um, let's see. so the mineralogy can affect the signal. However, at these very cold temperatures, all the, the effects of the mineralogy, like the, the, the relaxations that could be associated with the mineralogy, uh, probably will all, uh, 